Welcome back to German Traditional Clothing. We're gonna jump into the crazy history of dirndl. You can actually trace the origin of the style all the way back to the origins of bodices with big skirts. Starting in the early 1600s, they were especially popular in fashion amongst royals. Because full costumes follow a trend just like any other fashion, they copied the royal fashions of the time. This is how it spread into Bavaria and became the typical Austrian servant woman's work clothes. In the 1600s, we also had the origins of dress code. These laws separated the peasants from the elite, depending on what they were allowed to wear, and the peasants were allowed to wear dirndl. So until the mid-1800s, it was seen as a rural fashion for peasants. And the ideal form was developed or festivals, that was the beginning of Tracht. In the 1800s, we had the movement of romanticism, and it became popular amongst the elite once again. So stay tuned for part two. Bye! Welcome to part two of the history of dirndl. Things are about to get wild. Late 1700s, early 1800s, dirndl was only being worn by servants and other peasant women. Then came the Romanticism movement. These were artists that were obsessed with folk culture and rural societies. It was partly fueled by nationalism and a reaction against industrialization. The royals noticed it was getting really popular and it could work to strengthen national identity. So while at the first Oktoberfest in 1810, people had to wear French fashion, the 1835 Oktoberfest included a parade of traditional costumes. There was overwhelming national sentiment to preserve folk costumes. In 1869, the first Tracht Society started in Miesbach. Tons of royals in the area were wearing tracht, including Princess Elizabeth or Sisi. There was a type of dirndl even named after her. So dirndl was once again a la mode both for peasants and the elite. So dirndl was becoming very high fashion again. And top dirndl designers, the Jewish Wallach brothers, started coming on the scene. Stay tuned for part three. Okay, here we go. History of dirndl part three. Two of these three men were Julius and Moritz Wallach. They were German Jewish brothers who moved to Munich to start their own clothing line. They used really good, beautifully hand printed silks. They were key in making dirndl popular outside of rural societies. They would supply dirndl to the fancy European aristocracy, such as Princess Marie Auguste of Anhalt. They were also obsessed with all types of folk fashion. They made these little dolls. Like, look at that! He's so great. Following World War I, simpler forms of the dirndl became popular as a casual, summer, inexpensive dress. Then in 1930, the Wallach brothers provided the costumes for the White Horse Inn, or Im Weiße Rosso. It was a popular romantic comedy opera. It was set in the Alps, it was also filmed and distributed in the U.S. In 1936, the Von Trapp singers were also promoting dirndl and lederhose by wearing them on stage at the Salzburg Folk Festival. Tragically, with the appropriation of dirndl by the Nazis, everything was about to change. Stay tuned for part four. Welcome to part four of dirndl history. This is how it was appropriated and used by the Nazis. So the dirndl was instrumentalized by the Nazis as a symbol of pan-German identity. It was used to promote their idea of a woman who was hardworking and fertile. Part three, we talked about the Wallach brothers who were Jewish designers who were perhaps the biggest proponents of dirndl. As a result, dirndl and lederhosen were especially popular among German and Austrian Jews. But by 1938, Jews were forbidden to engage with any type of folk culture, including dirndl. Wallach brothers were forced to sell their company and move to the United States, and in fact, their brother Max was murdered in Auschwitz. We have Gertrude Pessendorfer. She led the Reich Commission of German Costume under the National Socialist Women's League. She wrote a bunch of books with designs on how to make your own dirndl. A lot of them have really ahistorical facts in them. Dirndl was actually modified in a bunch of ways that she called decatholicizing and a renewed costume. Kind of confusing because those changes were happening anyway in dirndl. The point is, this is what it came to symbolize. After part five, I promise things get better. Yes, okay, so I really want to emphasize this point. Again, this is Gertrude Pessendorfer. She was the head of the Reich Commission for German Costume under the Nazis. So remember, they took it away from the Jewish creators and they quote-unquote de-Catholicized it. The Nazi dirndl was way simpler than all of the complicated tracts from before. All of those minority cultures and ethnicity were suppressed, like Sorbs are not allowed to wear their clothing or speak their language. Remember, Catholics were also looked down upon, so a lot of the beautiful, ornate Catholic clothing was also suppressed. They took away all of the huge and beautiful headdresses from all around the country. The beautiful clothes that people use to identify their own culture. This is a very specific type of cultural genocide. We have to pay special attention to this because wiping out culture in this way was and still is a tool of white supremacy see parallels in huge amounts of cultural erasure here in the U.S. Which is why I made this series! Okay, back to dirndl history, here we go. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about how the Nazis de-Catholicized and renewed dirndl. They did this in two ways. One was by making it much less modest, which was happening anyway, and they took credit for it. And the second was by making it much simpler, taking away important cultural design. 
In these updated designs, the collar was removed, allowing for a deeper neckline. Long sleeves were removed and replaced with puffy short sleeves. The skirt was reduced from ankle length to mid length, and the bodice and the waist was made tighter with more buttons. Comparison, this is earlier fancy dirndl from Miesbach. But again, designers like the Wallach brothers were already making these updates in the 1930s that were going along with the fashions at the time. The National Socialist Women's League just took credit for those design updates. Nazis, though, the dirndl was supposed to accentuate the female form to sort of promote fertility, which is ick. Alongside that, they wanted to suppress all types of ornamentation. Their maxim was less is more. They worked to suppress all types of minority ethnic tracht, like the Sorbian tracht here. They tried to suppress tracht around Germany that wasn't dirndl. Headdresses like this were a no-no. We're still feeling the effects of this cultural homogenization today. Yes, I promised it would get better, and it does. Welcome to history of dirndl part six. Dirndl was a huge international fashion craze until Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. After that, dirndl popularity plummeted and it was replaced by the wasp waist phenomenon. For the next couple decades, dirndl was still definitely worn in Bavaria, but outside of that, it was always associated with Nazis. However, in 1972, the Summer Olympics were held in Munich. The hostesses famously wore dirndl. They were led by Sylvia Summerlath, who is now the Queen Sylvia of Sweden. Suddenly, everyone wanted dirndl again. I love this picture of women wearing dirndl in the 70s. In the 80s, dirndl was becoming popular in environmental and anti-nuclear groups as they sort of reclaimed traditional clothing. Kind of a cottagecore moment for them too. In the 90s, dirndl became even more popular, especially in Austria and Bavaria. Some people even called it a dirndl renaissance. And now dirndl is back and better than ever. Obviously, you see tons of women wearing it around Oktoberfest. There are also some super cool contemporary dirndl designers. I'll tell you all about it in part six. Welcome back to Dirndl History Part 7, we're talking about contemporary dirndl design. First, I want to point out that all dirndl are valid. It doesn't matter how much it costs or what it looks like, it's still a part of the folk culture legacy. However, here are a couple high fashion dirndl designers we should be paying attention to. The woman on the left is Lola Paltinger. She's considered by some to be the godmother of modern dirndl. She uses lots of shiny things, I love it so much. This is Gloria Cujo. She's an amazing Ghanaian German designer. She makes these gorgeous dirndl out of traditional Ghanaian cloth. Next up, we have Lina Hojek. She's famous for using these really cool, dense patterns. We have Marie Dauerich and Rame Vetterich. They are Cameroonian German sisters behind the labeled No Knee. It's another gorgeous example of African German fusion dirndl. Next, we have Ludwig and Therese. This label's dirndl is so sleek and modern, it's so, mmm, so pretty. The last one I have for you right now is Astrid Seul. She's famous for her more fairy tale princess design, notably with sheer backs. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.